Welcome to the Sharp 600, brought to you by Covers.com. I'm Rob Cressy, and I'm super excited to be jamming with you. And joining me on today's show is Andrew Cayley, Senior, Publish Senior Publishing Editor for Covers.com. You can follow him on Twitter at Covers underscore Cayley, and that's Cayley with a C. Andrew, <laughs> great to have you back on the show. I'm great to, I'm really happy to be here. Glad to hang out with you during these uh, crazy times. Yeah, me too. I love jamming with you and we're going to have some fun on today's episode. And the first thing that we're going to jam about is bankroll management, something that has been requested numerous times for us to talk about on the show. And I think now is the perfect time to talk about it. And for any of you who've been listening with me as the host for a while, I always end the show talking about be disciplined with your money management. Because for me to be a successful better, bankroll management is so, so, so important. And you know why? Because it's not sexy, but it's a <laughs> fundamental. And on the show, I like to teach sports bending fundamentals so that you can take this and learn and be a better, better yourself. So let's start with this. I'm curious how you handle bankroll management. Okay, so this is, there's some steps here. Um, first, you need to figure out uh, your, your bankroll. Determine what you can bet. Like, figure out what you can afford uh, to lose and don't exceed that. That's the first part about that being disciplined. Like, figure out what you can bet and stick to it. Second, determine your units. That's a really big, important thing. It's really easy to say, oh, I won... I won three bets this week and lost two, but depending on the VIG or the, uh, the number you got, you, that could be a losing week for you. So generally speaking, you should be tracking um, your bets in terms of units. Um, so what's a unit? For example, if you have a $1,000 bankroll, um, a rule of thumb here is that you, your betting unit should be between 1% and 2% of your bankroll. So in this case, between 10 and $20 per bet. That said, I have no problem in doubling up units every once in a while. If you're really confident in a bet, you have an angle that you really love, feel free to do that. Don't make that a habit though. This It's kind of like a, hey, I have this angle. I'm really confident in it. I'm going to put two units on this instead of one. Um, so Andrew, before you go on right there, um, yep. you actually literally read my notes without seeing my notes. My <laughs> only thing that I would add to that is my threshold is one to 5% of yep. my bankroll. So if you have a $1,000 bankroll, that means if you're betting one to 5%, it's either a $10 bet to a $50 bet. And if you can think about this even a different way, that'll give you 20 to 100 bets for your units. Well, why is this important? Because it is very important because the swings that are inevitable in sports betting, you're going to go 0 and 5, but you're also going to go 5 and 0. And when you're doing this on a per unit basis this way, what it really allows you to do is be as unemotional as possible on the size of the bet. Of course, us being sports bettors, we're going to be roller coasters when we're watching the game. <laughs> but we know the number of bad beats and the backdoor covers that happen in sports betting. And what we want to avoid is what is often glamorized in sports betting. The friend of yours who says, oh, I've got $500 on this game. He doesn't necessarily have a bankroll. He just bets nope. $500. And we know there is no such thing as free money in sports betting. As much as all of our friends want to say, oh, man, I'm crushing it in sports betting right now. We do this for a living. So we mm -hmm. know what the recipe for success looks like. So I just wanted to add that caveat in there that when I'm talking about the betting that I'm doing and when you see me on Twitter at Rob Cressy, I'm betting between 1% and 5% of my bankroll every single time. Yep, it's about the long haul. Like the, the goal here is to make a profit at the end of the day. And yes, those, those big wins are exciting. But uh, if you're piling those on with a lot of losses at the same time, the, those, it's not going to be as valuable in the long run. But I think that what you said does tie into my next point, which is track all of your results. Uh, be diligent in tracking the units won and the units lost. Use an app, use uh, an Excel spreadsheet, just an old pen and paper if you, if you want to do it old school. Um, but the reason is um, you can pinpoint exactly where you're winning and where you're losing. And then 
maybe you're you're killing it at MLB this week, so you want to get bet a uh, bet a little more, or maybe you're betting a five percent on your MLBs, where you're only doing so so on NFL, and you're only doing the one percent on your NFL bets. So it it allows you to focus uh, your money in a smart area. So I say track your bet results is very very important. Another step is to reevaluate your bankroll. Um, like you said. Uh, those three hour uh, fandoms are very emotional and you go on these heaters. Sometimes you get really excited just because you are on a bit of a heater. Doesn't mean you should necessarily increase it. You can increase the amount of money, but you keep the percentages the same. Always stick to that one to 5%. But say if you get your bankroll, we started to say at a, as an example of a thousand dollars, say you get up to 12, $1,300. You can incre uh, consider increasing the unit size, but the percentage remains the same. So don't, while you are maybe increasing the dollar amount, the percentage is the same. However, on the other side of that, don't increase your units to save yourself from losses. This is the number one thing. No, simply put, don't, do not chase your losses here. You're just going to end up digging yourself up. Knowing from personal experience, you're just going to end up digging yourself in a deeper and deeper hole in the long run. And it, it's definitely not worth it. And it's something that I actually talked about this uh, football season on the podcast when I had one of the inevitable down weeks and all of a sudden my bankroll took a major hit. Something like when you get like a two and seven or a two and eight. And really a lot of those times you're only one or two plays away from going 500 on the week. But yeah. all of a sudden, yeah. boom, didn't work, didn't work, didn't work. And it takes a lot of discipline when you see your thousand dollar bankroll go down to 700 for you to say, all right, now I'm betting between $7 and whatever that would do on the 5% side, $40 or something like that. And I actually did that. And you don't feel good necessarily doing no. the lesser unit because you're like, well, wait a second. I was betting $10 previously and now I'm down to seven. I'm not going to win as much. And you, you hear this internal dialogue but you have to understand this is a long-term philosophy and a process. This is no different than being like a trader for Goldman Sachs or some big <laughs> company where you've got a fundamental for success and that's what it is. And I can tell you the times in which I have built my bankroll, I've done it slowly building that thing up from, we'll keep the example, $10 goes to $12, goes to $14, goes to $17, goes to $20. And my friends will be like, oh, there's Rob. He's only putting $13 on a game. And I'm like, oh, by the way, this weekend, I've got 47 games that I'm playing across the board. Obviously, not all at once, but that's the way it works is instead of thinking of as, oh, I'm betting $500 on a game, any college football weekend, maybe you're sitting there with two or $300 in action going. And for me, being someone who's an action junkie, I care more about the entertainment than I do the, the winning side of the money side that I'm going to make. Of course, I love winning. Of course, I want to make money. But I'm also acutely aware that I'm not paying my mortgage on <laughs> sports betting alone as much as I would love to be able to get to that point. That's also bankroll dependent and being able to hit it over a 53% rate. Yeah, it's uh, like you said, it's it's discipline. It's all discipline. Uh, another thing that can make it easier for you is dividing your bankrolls into certain sports. Uh, so if you have that thousand dollars, say like 400 is for NFL and we're gonna go 300 MLB and 300 NBA. And it's just an easier way to break everything down for you as well. Um, uh, but what we were talking about, like, like, it's kind of a grind, right? You see those, you see those numbers dip and you, and you get stressed and you've got to put that aside. Uh, it, it's especially difficult when, you come, when it comes to money line betting. Um, for, for baseball, for example, uh, it, it can be hard to, to keep your focus when you have friends like that who are like, oh, I'm going to put $500 down when you're just doing your, your $15 bet at uh, minus 150 return. So you're only getting $22.5 out of it total. Uh, but especially with baseball when it's a lot of money line bets like that minus 150 minus 120 whatever it is or a, a rare dog every now and then or uh the goal here is long-term profit and it's not about that 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 big payout it's about being sustainable over the long run um and in that in that vein also stay away from parlays for the most part parlays are the most fun yes they are fun they're tempting because uh, the payout is much higher, but that so is so is the risk. The risk is incredibly high. Um, 
So I, I, I do bet them on occasion. And I'm not saying never bet them whatsoever because they can be fun. I would just not make them a habit when it comes to your bankroll. Um, yeah. And so stay disciplined. The, the, the basics are evaluate your units, reevaluate your units, always keep a track of everything and yeah, stay disciplined. And with what you mentioned about the parlays, I'll also throw the teaser side of it in there. So yeah. for me, I'm betting a one unit. If I want that parlay to be a unit, cool. But it doesn't mean that parlays and teasers and these money lines and things like that, that I'm getting um, double or triple. If anything, you're going to see my unit size decrease on a lot of the different things. So I think about the way that I play yeah. money yeah. lines in college football is a good example. I'm more likely to do a half unit money line parlay than I am a full unit because I understand I'm almost playing the float of the odds versus the payout there. And it's something yes, that yes. Uh, you also need to be able to almost eat crow if you're going to be playing money lines plus 150, 200, plus 250. Uh, certainly in college football, if you're looking at the spreads that are – you're taking a dog that's plus three to plus seven, something like that. Your win-loss record may not be good, but what you need to understand is what is the unit that you're doing? Because essentially you're saying, all right, if it's a plus 250, I bet that I can win this bet more often so that I'm going to be in the plus. So sometimes when you see records on apps where people track, you're going to see that. Um, maybe they are minus 11 in terms of a win-loss record, but they're plus on a unit. And you don't necessarily know what their units are, but I think that's an extremely important thing to understand in terms of how you're betting. And that's why it's so important to understand on a per-unit basis. And uh, once again, I want to reiterate this. What we don't want to be the uncomfortable part is – the amount of money that you're betting. Exactly. What we do want the uncomfortable bet to be is the side that you're on. And we always say that, <laughs> get comfortable being uncomfortable. It's not because this is half my bankroll. It's uncomfortable because we're taking um, a 34-point dog against Alabama on the road and you're like, oh, 80-20 rule. Let's get uncomfortable here. This is how we want you to be thinking about bankroll management. Exactly, exactly. Speaking of that, I had I remember last season I took the Rage and Cajuns to cover like 35 points against Alabama, and they they went up 28 to nothing at half. I was like, oh well, I'm toast. But the, they did what they the Alabama does. The, uh, Saban took off the gas there, and they were able to score a touchdown late in the game, and they they covered the the 28 and a half. It was great. <laughs> so this is actually a great segue because I want to have some fun right now. And, and one of the things that I love is being able to talk sports with someone because my <laughs> sports consumption has gone down by about 99% right now. It's <laughs> ridiculous for somebody who only watches sports, whose entire life is sports. Sports is almost a zero for me. But that being said, I want to have some story time. And I may have mentioned this previously on the podcast, but Back in the day, um, I graduated from college at Miami of Ohio, and I've always had entrepreneurial blood in me. I was always someone who created sports blogs. I taught myself HTML and things like that. I created fantasy football sites by hand and stuff like that. And I had an idea called RateMyGamblingStory.com. And at the time was when Hot or Not was a big thing. For any of you who remember this, and I'm certainly dating myself, where there's a segment of you out there who know what I'm talking about. And Hot or Not is a very simple concept. It was, a, it was like a rating website. So there'd be a picture of a guy or girl, and you would just rate how hot they are from an aesthetic standpoint. And me being an early better, and this was when was, I was in my early days, I was in my early 20s, and my bankroll was very, very little. But nonetheless, I loved betting. And with it, I was like, man, we all have such – gambling stories highs or lows because if you've ever been around a sports better we've always got stories to be able to tell whether we've been in vegas whether there's been a bad beat whether there's been an amazing backdoor cover so at the time i'm working at fifth third bank in a call center selling home equity loans working in a cube farm making ten dollars an hour it is literally the last place on earth i wanted to be but nonetheless I created RateMyGamblingStory.com and I just dreamed of the day 
where I was like, man, there's going to be a day where I'm going to talk about sports for a living. So this is going to be my first way of doing this. And I remember actually promoting the website by printing out um, on a piece of paper, ratemygamblingstory.com and taping it to the windows in the back windshield of my Toyota Camry that I would drive to work. And that's how I would promote the website was I just put it on my car right there. It was so janky and bootleg, but it was so fantastic. So I thought this was a great opportunity for you and I to have a little ratemygamblingstory.com moment. So Andrew, <laughs> Do you have a gambling story that you can share with us, good or bad? I guess this, I'll, I'll go with a bad first. Maybe if we're quick, we can go to a good one too. But uh, this, it falls under our, our rules we just laid out here. There was a Monday nighter a few years ago, ago. It was between the Chiefs and Bengals. And I pretty much ignored every single rule that we just laid out. I was on a heater and... I was just like, I'm just going to make one big wager tonight. I'm just going to do it. And I took the Chiefs minus six and a half and the over 56 and put oh, uh, several units, we'll say, down. And um, the Chiefs ended up covering easily that game. So that was never in question. And we had scored 55 points with the total was 56 with 1250 left in the game in the 1250 left in the fourth. And then not a single other point was scored in that game. Uh, the Chiefs even had a chance for a chip shot field goal with like five minutes to go. But Andy Reid went for it. He did a weird Andy Reid thing and, and went for it on fourth and four. I was like, How, isn't this more insulting than just kicking the field goal? Like, why, why are you not doing the Just kick the field goal. Why? And anyways, and, uh, and the Bengals couldn't score a point on the Chiefs' prevent defense at that point. Oh, my God. I was screaming for a whole quarter, just one more point. Just one. Oh, it was brutal. Anyway, they ended up losing the big bet and learning a big lesson. <laughs> and now I'm stricter when it comes to following those rules. <laughs> I, I love that because we've all been in those moments when you're cashing in a bet already. You're like, boom, 55, 12 <laughs> minutes to go. Piece of cake. You're dancing. And that is why... I the never bet until it happens, and <laughs> I also never give up on a bet until it happens. People are like, why are you still watching this? You're like, why am I still watching this? I've I seen it yet. Times <laughs> where I've been on the wrong end of this where Andy Reid goes for on fourth down, and you're like, oh, my God. You're screaming at the TV. You're like, what are you doing? <laughs> yeah, it was, uh, it was a tough one. So I've actually got two. So as I mentioned, I'm watching like virtually no TV right now. But yesterday while I'm cooking dinner with Mrs. Bacon, I was like, you know what? I'm going to throw on TV and just see what's on there. Because I know there's a lot of old school stuff. And I flip on yeah, ESPN yeah. to see Saints versus Falcons. And this is when Michael Vick and the Falcons were straight fire. And the Saints are coming back, their first game at home, coming back from Katrina. And for me, this is a very important game and a very memorable game. And you know why? Because I bet against the Saints, the game they came back from Katrina. No, no joke. <laughs> and, and I think the Falcons were a four-point road favorite, which right now goes against all fundamentals of what I would bet. But like you, you live and you learn. So I turn on the TV, and literally within one second, I know exactly what's about to happen. The, it's 0-0. Zero, zero. It's... Uh, two minutes into the game and the Falcons are punting and I'm like oh my god and literally they snap the ball the Saints block the punt touchdown Saints game goes over the crowd is going bananas and literally it brought me back to that exact moment because <laughs> from that time they blocked the punt and it was like literally the worst case scenario you could have for the Falcons. They're coming back from Katrina. Drew Brees is going nuts. The crowd is going nuts. And of course, I turn on the TV literally, literally as they are showing the blocked punt happening. This happened 12, not even 12 hours ago. Literally just happened to me. But the, <laughs> the real rate, my gambling story moment that I want to give you is actually on the good side of things. And it's my greatest bet ever. So I'm from Pittsburgh and I have a love-hate relationship with the Pitt Panthers. They've always been my team, but they haven't given me a lot to love me back. It's one of those things <laughs> where I, I want to root for them. Larry Fitzgerald was amazing, but like for the majority of my life, Pitt has not treated me well. 
And all of a sudden, it's 2007 backyard brawl. Pitt, who's four and seven at the time, taking on number two West Virginia in Morgantown. They're 10 and one. If West Virginia wins this game, they go to the national title. And that West Virginia team was straight fire. Pat White's the quarterback. Steve Slayton's the running back. Noel Devine is the freshman running back. They are just absolutely incredible. Pitt comes in as a 28 and a half point dog. There is no reason I should be watching this game or doing anything. But here's the thing. I learned, and it was really by betting SEC football, where you just throw out all the records. When two teams go, when it's Auburn versus Alabama or something like, throw the records out. So I'm like, you know what? I'm going to throw the records out. This is just a rivalry game. It makes no sense. Give me the Pitt Panthers money line, 28 and a half. <laughs> and what ends up happening? Pat White dislocates his finger or dislocates his thumb in the second quarter. His thumb. Leaves a majority of the game. And then West Virginia ends up turning the ball over like a million times. They miss a million field goals, things like this. Rich Rod is the coach. And lo and behold, one of the worst Pitt Panther teams in the entire world wins 13 to 9. And I remember exactly where I was. I was living in Cincinnati at the time, and I was going out at the bars and I was only able to catch or see some of this game. And I'm following this ticker, and the, the score goes final, and I'm going bananas. And I'm actually with none of my friends at the time. I was uh, chasing a girl that I was out for. So there was other priorities than this Pitt-West Virginia game. But it was the greatest sports betting victory of my life as a 28-and-a-half point dog because I learned you can throw the record books out the window during rivalry games. Oh, yeah. College football is crazy like that, man. Do you, oh, do you good. as we cap this off, do you have a good story? My good story is just from this last season. I, uh, I have said on here before I'm a unabashed Raptors fan. So, but, uh, but like I follow basketball pretty, pretty closely. And I was, I thought it was crazy at the beginning of the year that they were the third favorite to win the Atlantic division with Kawhi Land. They were behind the Celtics and the Sixers going into the season. So I hammered the Raptors before the season started. I was like, okay, this is, this is pretty good now. Like, and about uh, three quarters of the way of the season, that, that, bet was sealed up and then the playoffs were uh, like the playoff odd, the title odds before the playoffs came and the Raptors were like still the sixth or seventh favorites to win the title then I was like okay so I, I bet them again I bet them win the title then and then they eventually get to the finals and there's where they were they were one of the greatest underdogs at least at, in terms of money line against the Warriors even without Kevin Durant they, they were one of the bigger money line underdogs in a finals history and I bet them again, and they just kept – it was so magical to watch them. Just nobody believed in them all season, and up here in Canada, we think we we get disrespected a whole lot about that. So it was a lot of fun to see them go all the way through, and they just kept winning and proving people wrong over and over and over again. And uh, it led me into betting them again this year, so hoping uh, we get the season at some point or those some of those bets uh, get cashed out at some point. But uh, – yeah, it was just – it was a lot of fun with the Raptors last year. Nice. That's awesome because even better as a Raptors fan to be able to go through that entire ride. It's like – it's the ultimate of what a sports fan and a sports better wants when you're yeah. betting on yeah. your team and they reward you at the same time and they're winning. So yeah. – we all have amazing gambling stories, and we would love to hear yours. Do you have a gambling story, good or bad? Chances are you're probably going to need to send it to us in video form on Twitter, um, unless you can describe it in 280 characters, which will be tough. But nonetheless, would love to be able to hear them from you. And I'm actually super excited about – uh, what the rest of the month is going to look like for this podcast. You know why? Because we've got UFC 249 coming up on a week in a week. Then we also have the NFL draft coming up a little bit after that. So there is actually some really good sports that are going to be going down that we're going to be able to talk about from a betting perspective. So definitely make sure to check back into the Sharp 600. So Andrew, I love jamming with you. Where can everybody connect with you? You can find me on Twitter at covers underscore Kaylee. Uh, not a whole lot of content right now. We're working hard to uh, get the site all shiny and clean for when sports does come back. Uh, other than that, we're uh, baking bread and building blanket forts at home right now. I saw that fort. Shout out to creating forts. I love <laughs> yeah. creating 
was back in the day, especially using Nerf guns or <laughs> Nerf anything, Nerf balls, because what we would do is make our own version of American Gladiators. <laughs> uh, underutilized tool is um, clothes, uh, uh, clothes pins for hanging clothes. They're very useful when it comes to the blanket four. Absolutely love that. And I want to hear from you. Do you have a gambling story? You can hit me up on Twitter at Rob Cressy. Make sure to use hashtag sharp 600 and be part of our community. And also make sure to tag at covers. And one thing that I've really enjoyed throughout the year is everyone who's given us a rating and review on iTunes and given me feedback on what you think about the show. Um, what I like so much about it is it shows the health of the community. You're given positive vibes. And for a lot of you, it's actually having positive feedback. And I think an episode like this is one when it, regarding bankroll management that can have a positive impact for you. So would love it if you give us a rating review on iTunes, because if you do, I will give you a shout out on the show. And remember, you want to be a sharp, don't be a square with your bankroll, be disciplined with your money management.